first of all, I'd like to thank the board and all those concerned with invi for inviting me here to speak today on the Grijalva River. Uh, I will give a, my caveat to begin with, I am no scholar on the Book of Mormon. We already heard all the scholars this morning. Uh, I took an interest in the Book of Mormon, as noted in my biography there, that uh, after reading Richard Houck's book on the geography of the Book of Mormon, and then set out to come to my own conclusions about where the Book of Mormon took place. So today I'm going to stick a little bit off on the Grijalva River, if I can find this little button. Right. Historically, the Kilcomora in New York has been used as a starting point to propose a geography of the Book of Mormon. Oops, I've got to get it down. To propose a geography of the Book of Mormon. But with the publication of Sorensen's now classic study, it is generally accepted that the New York Hill is not the same hill as that mentioned in the Book of Mormon. Because there is no textual description that allows for an unequivocal location of the Book of Mormon, Hill Cumorah, it cannot be used as an anchor point for a geography. We must look in the text for geographical features that can be uniquely identified. One such feature is the narrow strip of wilderness described in Alma 22 and as pointed out by uh, Brother Carr. A second feature is the probable location on the southern coast to the Gulf of Mexico of the ruins of a pre-Nephite culture discovered by the Limhite search party as described in Alma 22 verse 30. Using these two features, an internal map based on Alma 22 can be mapped to a location in the Americas. <clears throat> In Alma 22, verses 27 through 35, also known as Mormon's map, list, this, uh, this, this scripture lists at least 15 geographic features related to Book of Mormon geography and the location of the River Sidon. These are the land of Nephi, the sea east, the sea west, the land of Zarahemla, the narrow strip of wilderness, borders of the seashore, borders of Manti, head of the river Sidon, the land of Lehi's first inheritance, the land of Bountiful, the land of desolation, the small neck of land, of land, land whose people were destroyed, discovered by Limhi's expedition and the people of Zarahemla, the land northward and the land southward. Any plausible model for Book of Mormon geography must, geography must account for all of these geographic features, and I do mean all, and locate them in the same relationships as described in the text. <clears throat> in Alma 22, verse 27, we read, and it came to pass that the king sent a proclamation throughout all the land amongst all his people who were in, all, in his, all his land, who were in all the regions round about, which was bordering even to the sea east and on the sea, uh, to the sea uh, on the, even to the sea on the east and on the west, and which was divided from the land of Zarahemla by a narrow strip of wilderness which ran from the sea east even to the sea west. I can't see that pointer, so I won't use it. <laughs> you just have to find it yourself. <laughs> As explained by John Clark in his review of the deciphering of the geography of the Book of Mormon by Richard F. Uh, F. Richard Hauck, build an, we must build an eternal map before we can attempt to con correlate real geography with the geography described in the text. In the first half of verse 30 to 27, the text describes how the Nephite and Lamanite lines, lands were late, related to each other and that the two lands were separated by a narrow strip of wilderness that stretched 
from an east sea to a west sea. The river Sidon is located in the land of Zarahemla. Continuing the same verse, and round about on the borders of the seashore, this narrow strip of wilderness comes up along the borders of the seashore, and the borders of the wilderness, which was on the north by the land of Zarahemla, through the borders of Manti, by the head of the river Sidon, running from east towards the west, and thus were the Lamanites and the Nephites divided. This shows the division between the Lamanites and the Nephites. In the second half of verse 22, we learn that an extension of the narrow strip that was on the north of the land of Zarahemla and make it clear that Zarahemla was to the north with Manti somewhere in between. The head or tributaries, or even, you might even call it a confluence of the river Sidon within the narrow strip of run, uh, wilderness runs from the east towards the west. In verse 28, now the more idle part of the Lamanites lived in the wilderness and dwelt in tents, and they were spread throughout the wilderness on the west. I often think that this particular verse demonstrates uh, Mormon's uh, prejudice towards the Lamanites. Uh, in the land of Nephi, yea, and also in the west of the land of Zarahemla, in the borders by the seashore, and on the west in the land of Nephi, in the place where their father's first inheritance, and thus bordering along the seashore. As you can see, these, this describing all of these lands is located somewhere along the West Sea. Uh, verse 29, and also there were many Lamanites on the east by the seashore. With Monday, did I forget? That's 28. Okay, thank you for me. 28. Okay, keep me on track there. <laughs> And also there were many Lamanites on the east by the seashore, whither the Nephites had driven them. And thus the Nephites were nearly surrounded by the Lamanites. Nevertheless, the Nephites had taken possession of all the lands north, of the border, uh, north bordering on the wilderness at the head of the river Sidon from the east to the west, round about on the wilderness side on the north, even until they came to the land which they called Bountiful. If I can make the... Oops... I can make this pointer work. Can't see it. Okay. This also, this verse also points out that Bountiful is north of Zarahemla. In verse 30, and it bordered upon the land which they called Desolation, it being so far northward that it came into the land north, the land which was peopled and then destroyed of whose bones we have spoken, which was discovered by the people of Zarahemla, it being the place of their first landing. Desolation contains the bones spoken of in Mosiah 8, verses 7 through 12. If you're more interested in this, you can read the footnotes at the bottom of page 266 of the Book of Mormon. It also indicates that this location is also where the people of Zarahemla first landed. Verse 31. I got it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, and they came from there up into the south wilderness. Thus the land on the northward was caused, called desolation, and the land on the southward, that is southward from the land of desolation, was called bountiful, it being the wilderness which is filled with all manner of wild animals of every kind, a part of which had come from the land northward for food. After landing there, it's talking about the Zarahemlites, they came up to the land of Zarahemla, indicating that Bountiful was at a higher elevation than desolation. This is confirmed in the record of the final wars 
where the te text indicates that the Lamanites came down to desolation and the Nephites went up to Bountiful and Zarahemla. Verse 32. <coughs> and now it was only the distance of a day and a half's journey. Uh, isn't that... Oh, okay, it's, I'm kidding it. It's not going forward. Maybe I should point it backwards. And now it was only the distance of a day and a half's journey for a Nephite on the line Bountiful and the land Destillation from the east to the west sea. And thus the land of Nephi and the land of Zarahemla were nearly surrounded by water, there being a small neck of land between the no land northward and the land southward. This indicates that the boundary between Bountiful and Desolation extended to the West Sea, and that, this des and that Desolation not only extended into the land northward, but extended to the West Sea, most likely including all of the narrow neck of land. And it came to pass that the Nephites had inhabited the land bountiful, even from the east unto the west sea, unless the Nephites in their wisdom with their guards and their armies had hemmed in the Lamanites on the south, that thereby they should have no more possession on the north, that they might not overrun the land northward. As indicated by the description of the border between bountiful and desolation, here again the text indicates that the land of bountiful extends to the west sea. is clicking us now. Here we have <coughs> my figurative uh, Mormon's map. With this internal map, including at least two known anchor points found only in Meso Mesoamerica, we can now attempt to map this to the real world. We have the narrow strip of wilderness, and we have the land of desolation where the ruins that were discovered were found. If we bring up a map here from Google Maps of Mesoamerica, and I think we're all agreed. Maybe we're not all agreed here, but at least all of us that are speaking are, are agreed that the Book of Mormon culture took, uh, took place in Mesoamerica. By rotating uh, Mormon's map, internal, my Mormon's internal map, a few degrees to the west, about a fixed point in the narrow strip of wilderness, we get the following fit to Mesoamerica. Didn't click? There it is. Okay. <clears throat> this fitting places the northern, the northern part of the land of desolation in the Olmec heartland and results in placing the land of Zarahemla somewhere in the Chiapas central depression. We move all the extraneous ovals and things. We get this mapping uh, of the various lands of the Book of Mormon to Mesoamerica. I wish my pointer would work, but you can read there. You see the land of desolation starting at the West Sea and going up to the land of, uh, up to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the land of Bountiful stretching across there in the middle, the land of Zarahemla, just below it, sandwiched between the land of Bountiful and the land of Zarahemla, with the Nephite land to the south of the narrow strip of wilderness. Oh, there. No wonders it's not doing it. Only, it takes two clicks. Uh, <coughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about borders that are described in the text. We have two principal borders described in the text. The one was previously mentioned, the boundary. Uh, the boundary That's another I mean, uh, arrow. Will it show up better? Oh, oh, hey. I can see that one. How about that? <laughs> okay. Uh, we have the boundary between desolation and bountiful, which is described in Alma, 2232, and I'll repeat that, keep it fresh in your mind. And now it was only the distance of a day and a half's journal 
for a Nephite on the land bountiful and the land desolation from the east to the west sea. We have another boundary described in the Book of Mormon, which is often confused with the boundary between desolation and bountiful. This one is described in Helaman, beginning with verse 5. And in the 50 and second year, they did come down against the Nephites to battle, and they did commence the work of death. Yea, insomuch that the, in the 50 and eighth year of the reign of the judges, they succeeded in obtaining possession of the land of Zarahemla. Yea, and also all the lands, even unto the land which was near the land, of, the land bountiful. And the Nephites and the armies of, the, of Moron, Moroniha were driven even into the land of the bountiful. They were driven into the land of bountiful and out of the land of Zarahemla. And there they did fortify against the Lamanites from the west sea even unto the east, it being a day's journey for a Nephite on the line which they had fortified and stationed their armies to defend their north country. They were driven into the land of Bountiful. They turned around, set up a line of fortification, which was between Bountiful and Zarahemla, not between Desolation and Zarahemla. If we now place these two boundaries, these lights are so bright that I can't see anything, but here you can see one between desolation and bountiful and another one between bountiful and Zarahemla. Adding borders, we get the following map. It is unimportant how we define a day's journey, but it is important to realize that these borders extended to the West Sea and that desolation, bountiful, and Zarahemla border on the West Sea. It is undefined how far they extend to the east. <clears throat> In 3 Nephi chapters 3 and 4, we have another a little account. This is what I call the Battle of Laconius. In verse 13 of chapter 3, it reads, Yea, he sent a proclamation among all the people that they should gather together their women and their children, their flocks and their herds, and all their substances, save it were their land, unto one place. This is called scorched earth policy. They're taking everything out of the land that would support an army or anyone. And then in verse 23, he says, And the land which was appointed was the land of Zarahemla, and the land which was between the, was the land of Zarahemla, and the land which was between the land Zarahemla and the land Bountiful, yea, to the line which was between the land Bountiful and the land Desolation. Okay, they're going back to the same area again, these same borders again. And they're, they're effectively, Laconius has uh, said we're going to use a scorched earth policy. Okay, here is a modern map showing <clears throat> the Grijalva River Valley, and all of these names here are ancient settlements. You can see it was very well settled. Most of these, as discovered by the NWAF, were cities that existed at the time of the Book of Mormon. Okay? As can be seen in this slide, the Grijalva River Basin was filled with pre-Columbian settlements, most of which were pre-classic and dated to the time of the Nephite time, time period. In order for Laconius to implement his scorched earth policy for every place between the Lamanite territory and the borders between Zarahemla and Bountiful Desolation, as described previously, he would need to have political control of the entire Grijalva Basin. This would only be true if the Grijalva River Basin was one and the same as the land of Zarahemla. To summarize <coughs> this incident, we, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we find Laconius imposes scorched earth policy. 
The Nephites gather at a border between Zarahemla and Bountiful Desolation. The Nephites have plenty of provisions for war. The Lamanites are starving and forced to try to get supplies from the Nephites. Nephites block access to the land northward. Nephites destroy the Lamanite army. Going back to uh, point five, Neph Nephites block access to the land northward. In order to block access the land nor to the land northward, they would need to control access from both the Grijalva River Basin and the route along the West Sea Seashore. Okay, let's change subject just a bit here. <clears throat> Brother Carr has very well described this little diagram. As first suggested, it was actually first suggested by Jerry Ainsworth. I, he's here, so we'll give him credit, to my knowledge. As, the first, as first suggested by Jerry Ainsworth in his book, Travels of Mormon and Moroni, uh, Pre-Columbian cultures divided their lands into quarters, quarters based on the summer and winter solstice. This has been conferred recently by Hopkins and Jesseron based on linguistics. In a review published on the Neil A. Maxwell's website, I was able to demonstrate with high probability, based on the use of directional vectors, that the Book of Mormon culture used a similar concept for dividing their land into quarters. I might add, this doesn't mean they didn't know what north, south, east, and west was. It's just that these are the points along which they divided their land into quarters. If we do the, uh, lay, uh, lays this over our previously developed map, we see that applying this to our map, we get this suggested mapping of Alma 22 to Mesoamerica. Because we have no evidence from the text in Alma 22 about how far the land of Zarahemla extended to the east, we must look elsewhere for more information. As, as documented extensively by Sorensen, the Book of Mormon text uses the terms up and down to describe changes in elevation, not direction along a river or directions based on map orientation. In fact, both pre-Columbian and Near Eastern cultures oriented their maps with east at the top, as documented on my website and at the Neil, <coughs> in the Neil A. Maxwell uh, article mentioned previously. Based on this concept, we conclude that the la when I mapped, I mapped the two rivers. One is in blue, that's the Grijalva River, and the other one is in red, that's the Usamacinta River. Only the Grijalva River shows an intermediate elevation before entering into the highlands. The Usamacinta River, yes, it gra increases gradually but then very sharply goes up into the, into the highlands. <clears throat> As shown in this figure, only the Grijalva, River, uh, Grijalva Basin shows an intermediate elevation as one travels from the mouth on the gulf to the highlands of Guatemala. We'll now go away from good looking maps to my crude drawings. We ask the question, what is the significance of the unusual reference to directions, the atypical use of on the north and on the west instead of northwest in Alma 2, verse 37? Additional support for the conclusion that the city of Zarahemla is located somewhere near the center of the Grijalva Depression is found in the description of the battles with the Amlicites in Alma 2. The Isthmus of Tehuantepec is known even today as the hills or mountains of the man-eating beast. Sorensen reported that the word Hermounts is related to the name of the Egyptian god of wild beasts. And this, coupled with the name Tehuantepec, suggests that the Chimalapa Mountains on the eastern border of the Isthmus is a good candidate for Hermounts. If we center the borders of the Mesoamerican Quarter, system on the Grijalva River, and then follow the summer solstice line. See if you can get it. To, uh, if you follow that summer solstice line to the northwest and go back and forth across that border on the north, the north quarter, 
and on the south, on the south quarter, you will come to the Chimalapa Mountains in about 40 to 50 miles. If you look at this in Google Earth, you will find that you must go back and forth across that line to avoid volcanic upthrusts. You'll quickly see that in order to avoid small upthrusts, you must travel back and forth on the west and on the north of the line separating the north and west quarters, just as is described in Alma 237. Now you got it there. Good for you. <laughs> you can see that summer solstice line, that's the, uh, the blue line going to the northwest. In conclusion, thank you. Uh, mo mapping Mormon's map to Mesoamerica places the land of Zarahemla within the Grijalva River Basin. The intermediate altitude of the basin and the need to the, for the basin to be under Laconius's control suggests that the principal parts of the land of Zarahemla are located within this basin. The excellent evidence that the Chimalapa Mountains are the wilderness of hair mounts described in the Book of Mormon suggests that the city of Zarahemla is located near the center of the basin. Because according to the text, the because according to the text, the river Sidon is located near the city of Zarahemla and in the land of Zarahemla, one must conclude that the Grijalva River and the Sidon River are one and the same river. Thank you very much. Larry, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Well, I did I stay under my time? You're, you're good. Ted?